This is Bill Moberly with the Americans in Wartime Museum conducting an interview with William Howenstein at St. Matthew's United Methodist Church on the 9th of March, 2020. So Bill, how did you find yourself coming into the military? Tell us a little bit about your background and, and the things that may have influenced you. Good to morning. Join. Uh, well, it started, I actually was in college at Ohio State University. I was born and raised in Southern Ohio little town, relatively small town called Lancaster, mm -hmm. which a lot of folks migrated to Ohio State from there. So I finished Ohio State, I graduated in 1958. Mm -hmm. At the time I graduated, I was also eligible for the draft. I'd already received my draft notice. I was to be inducted as a draftee in July of that year. So I started to explore the possibilities of a military career or not a career. Uh, not not really a career, military duty in lieu of being drafted. So I went into the various uh, services and asked what kind of proposal or what kind of uh, education or what kind of program they offered and I found that the Navy was the only one that offered a guaranteed to go to officer candidate school if you enlist as an OC, which is officer candidate, they would guarantee that they would put you in officer candidate school and the ag agreement you had to sign was that if you failed out of the officer candidate school you would have to do be a white hat or a sailor in the fleet for at least two years. The other services on the other hand, the only th agreement they would make is that you had to enlist and then apply for officer candidate school and you were not guaranteed that. So I elected to go into the Navy and at the time, strangely enough, when I went to the officer of naval officer procurement, which was then called ONOPS in Columbus, Ohio. He said, what is your education in Ohio, at Ohio State? What are you studying? I said, well, I'm going to graduate in business. And he said, oh, well, you'd make a good supply officer. And I said, uh, well, what is that? And he said, well, it's a really a good program and I know you'll enjoy it and you'll go to OCS as a supply officer candidate and graduate with that commission. And I said, okay, fine. So. That's in effect what happened. I signed with the Navy in July. I was to be inducted. I said, what about the draft? And they said, well, don't worry. We'll write a letter to your draft board about you being accepted in the Navy OCS program. So after that, I was ordered back home and, and I stayed. I was ordered to OCS in July or uh, August of 58, which was in Newport, Rhode Island. It was a four or five month program he commissioned upon graduation from OCS and I went to Newport in July and I graduated in December of 1958 and was commissioned as an Ensign Supply Corps USNR, which is reserve. You didn't get a regular commission in those days. Uh, I also was married shortly thereafter, a week after, to my bride who was a, also a student at Ohio State. We met at Ohio State. We'd scheduled our wedding between going from graduating from OCS to a school. In the, in the Supply Corps, you went to a basic six-month indoctrination course after you graduated from OCS to prepare you for fleet duty, which was to immediately follow the school. So in effect, that's what we did. We, went, we were married in Lancaster. We moved to Athens, Georgia, and I commenced the introductory uh, Supply Corps school. What I didn't know at the time I went to OCS was that there was definitely different programs in the Navy. There was a line officer program. There were other engineering programs that you had to have a degree in engineering, but Supply Corps officer was kind of unique. And I learned many of the officers at OCS, they were told when they signed up that they could trade when they got to OCS one for the other, depending on what their preference was, but that isn't the way it worked out. When they got there, they said, no, you can't trade. You have to, if you want to switch, you have to do that after you graduate later on. So anyway, I went to a six months course in Athens. Following that, I went to my first ship, which was an LST, the USS Grant County. This would have been in 19, in the summer of 59, or the winter of 50, 50, 59, 59, 60. It was a small ship, it happened to be brand new, just been commissioned, it carried an officer wardroom of about 12 officers. And what happened in my case, which was unusual, 
is that when I reported for duty, the captain of the ship, who is a lieutenant commander, said, Bill, I don't have enough officers on this ship to man the bridge the way I want to, so you're not really going to act as a spy corps officer on this ship. You're going to be more of a line officer, so you're going to spend the majority of your time on the bridge. So that, in effect, what happened. Uh, I didn't spend my first two years on, as a supply corps officer on a ship as you traditionally would. I ended up on the bridge. We were standing one and three, one and four watches. And, and during that time, I was able to, and I enjoyed it very much, but during that time, I was able to qualify as a surface warfare officer, as a supply officer, which is un unusual because most supply officers don't do that. So following the two years on, on uh, LST, which was very enjoyable, we were at that time, this would have been the 1959, 60, 61 time frame. We did most of our work in the Caribbean because we were attached to an amphibious group. Uh, and the reason I was on an LST, if we go back a little, when I was in school in Athens, the, I had a, there was a first class supply, there was a first class storekeeper in that class, and he said, Bill, they're going to try to get you to put in for a destroyer, but let me, let me tell you, he said, destroyers spend most of their time in the North Atlantic. And if you want to be in the North Atlantic during the winter, you better ask for an amphibious ship because they go south into the Caribbean. And that's where you want to spend your time. So I put in for an amphibious ship, where, which was most of the folks graduating from the school were asking for destroyers because that was the tradition at the time. So anyway, that's how I ended up in an amphibious ship. We'd spent most of our time in the Caribbean, warm weather, carrying Marines, amphibious group, amphibious operations, in those days, uh, Gitmo and what have you, and, and I spent an enjoyable two years. Mm -hmm. when, <clears throat> excuse me. You were on a landing ship tank, LST. Yeah, LST, right. How had it changed, if any, from World War II versions of This that was ship? the last version of the traditional what one thinks about as an LST, where the bow doors open, the ramp comes down. First of all, you have to beach the ship. You have to put the, the beach, you have to put the ship, depending on the gradient of the, of the beach, you have to put the ship, you, you run the ship into the beach, you open the door, or you open the doors beforehand. And they're, they're, they're spring-loaded, so they give a little bit as the ship grounds out on the beach. Then you put the ramp down. Then the equipment that's on the tank deck of the ship, and we were carrying, most of the time we were carrying marine LVTs, which is a large amphibious, uh, it's like an amphibious tank carrying Marines. We also carried regular Marines. They would go out through the deck, through the, through the, uh, the uh, ramp onto the beach. Or we had a causeway. We also sometimes carried large causeways on the side of the ship, which would drop and floated, put in front of the ship. The ramp would be put down, hooked onto the causeway, and the causeway would be ramped into the beach, and then the things would drive off onto the causeway. So that was, and that was the last, uh, that class of ship, it was the 1170 class, was the last uh, LST of that class. Following that, the, then the amphibious ships that followed, uh, they tried different mechanisms. Uh, they tried to uh, build the ship so it had a normal ship bow and they had a ramp that came up over the bow and went down to the beach and the equipment would have to ride out over that. It didn't prove to be too practical. Then they had some ships that they put a, a rear door, a rear ramp on, but it didn't do practical either because they couldn't get them into the beach. You can't back into a beach, and you, don't, you can't go into deep water with those kind of uh, LVTs. So slowly, the amphibious process, the amphibious ships of that amp with the amphibious ramps that went down were slowly phased out. Our class, I believe, was the last class of that that had that capability, which is what one thinks about traditionally as an amphibious landing. And then slowly what happened over time is it went from an amphibious landing where the ships actually pulled into the beach to a, to a vertical envelopment where you use helicopters. And the helicopters carried the equipment and the troops and landed them in, or other amphibious type hovercraft that would into the beach, but that developed later on in time. Mm -hmm. So when you would land an LST on a beach, how would they get it back off the beach? Okay, interesting question. Uh, 
the one of the one of the worst things that could happen to an LST is if you went into the beach, you, it would be to breach the beach where the ship would become vertical, would become parallel to the beach. Then you couldn't get off. But you had a stern anchor, which was a winch, a large anchor and a winch on the back of the ship, similar to the ones you had on the bow. But these were designed to be when you were going and approaching the beach, you dropped the anchor at a certain point. You calculated how long it was going to run, and you had to make sure you had it right because if you ran that anchor chain, ran, uh, anchor cable off that winch, you were in big trouble. You couldn't really back off. But if the anchor went down and the winch went in and the cable were com was coming off the beach, when actually when the ship grounded out on the beach, you would offload, deballast. And then you would start fishtailing the ship slowly back and forth at the same time taking a strain on the winch and pull yourself off uh, off the beach with that winch. Yeah. And then once you got out, you could go on from there. I only saw two cases of where an LST breached uh, horizontally to the beach because they misjudged the anchor drop, the cable came off the winch, they kept on going and the surf and the current caused them to go thwart ships across the beach. Mm. And they, en they eventually had to get a tug with a, with, a, with a cable to attach and drag it off. Mm -hmm. But that's not something you would have, never happened with us. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was fun. Mm. Enjoyed, I, enjoyed, uh, I enjoyed that time. When you were um, qualifying as a weapons officer, what, what kind of weapons would you be qualifying on on that ship? We didn't have very many weapons on an LST. We actually actually two thirty uh, two multi gun mounts on the forward on forward starboard and port side. That's all the ship really the ship was defense it had. They were automatic. They were based on a radar, um, but there was very limited. 3-inch 50s were very limited in their capability of what they could do. They weren't designed, they were designed for self-defense, but very limited. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the amphibious ships depended on other types of ships to protect them if they needed any protection. They were very, not very, we had no, in those days, uh, we had no, no missiles, and those were the only two mounts we had. Mm -hmm. So not much had changed since World War II on them then. No, yeah. no, not, not, no. This was a follow-on from World War II. Mm -hmm. There were a few LSTs left from, the old, from World War II in those days, but very few. And these were diesel-powered. These, the ships, the newer LSTs were diesel-powered, where uh, during World War II they were both, some of them were steam-powered, which was, which was, but these were diesel-powered, had six diesel, diesel engines, so they could run Two, they were twin propellered, but they were flat bottom, as an LST is. So uh, diesel is much easier to manipulate and maneuver than steam powered. They respond much quicker, sure. basically. So that was my first two years, and then we went. Then I was tr ordered from the LST after two and a half years. I was ordered at the time I was going to get out of the Navy. Mm -hmm. uh, I was ordered to Indianapolis, Indiana, to a naval avionics facility. That was uh, in Indianapolis. Its basic was attached to the Naval Air Systems Command, and it really was uh, aviation oriented. And I was fortunately at that time I was ordered into the the supply department and, and into contracting and procurement division, which is the first exposure I had. Most of my career subsequent to this, in the later years, I was a acquisition specialist for major systems acquisition. That's what I did mostly. Mm -hmm. um, I was ordered, to, and, and that's where I learned into contracting and procurement. Midway during that tour, I was there for two years. Midway during that term, the commanding officer said, Bill, I'd like you to consider a regular Navy, and I'd like you to apply for regular Navy Supply Corps. And I, at the time, I really wasn't sure. But my wife and I had talked about it, and they said, Bill, we'll, we think, he said, I, want you, I think you'd make a fine Naval officer. I'd like you to apply for regular Navy. So. After careful consideration, we'd enjoyed the Navy so far, I did just that. Mm -hmm. And I was accepted as a regular officer into the regular Navy with a regular commission versus the reserve commission, which is what you get coming out of OCS. Mm -hmm. After that tour in procurement, I was ordered to, uh, they called me and said, we'd like to send you to Formosa. And at the time I said, where is Formosa? And it wasn't called Taiwan or in those days. It was. 
So we went, looked it up on a map, and it was in the Far East, and it looked like an adventure. So we, I said, okay. So we went from Indianapolis, Indiana, to Taiwan, Taipei, in the early 60s. And at the time, I was attached to a headquarters support activity, which was attached to the defense, Taiwan Defense Command. And in those days, this was in 63, 64, 65, the Southeast Asia was just beginning to heat up. They were just starting to have problems in Vietnam, Southeast Asia, Laos, and what have you. And no, but in those days, when I was in Taiwan, it was not closed. You could travel to, to uh, Vietnam on R&R, on &R, rest and relaxation, but it slowly built up over time. And I left Taiwan, we'd spent two and a half years in Taipei. I was a, I was a lieutenant in those days. Uh, had a really enjoyable tour. Uh, and I was in procurement, again, in the contracting control division of Headquarters Support Activity Taipei, supporting the Taiwan Defense Command. We had a lot of military in Taiwan in those days. We had uh, Army, Navy, and Air Force MAGs, and we also had the Taiwan Defense Command, who was at that time headed up by a three-star admiral. So we spent most of my time in those days supporting logistically Taiwan and also some Southeast Asia. Uh, they were just starting, it was just starting to heat up. Uh, following Taiwan, I was ordered to come back to the U.S. to the Aviation Supply Office in, Ta in Philadelphia, which is a part of the aviation community buying spare parts and aviation supply. Uh, at the, at the time, we were at ASL as a lieutenant. At that time, um, I applied for postgraduate school while I was at ASO during those two and a half years. Uh, I, I was also, in the, at that time, a division in a deputy division director in the contracting division. Ordered to, after, after midway in that tour, I was accepted to uh, University of Michigan for graduate school left ASO to get it, and we went to Michigan for a year in 1968. Graduated in uh, 1968 from the University of Michigan in their master's, in their MBA program. Then I went to Director of Procurement Contracting at the Naval Supply Center in Puget Sound, which was then those, in those days a part on the same a geographical landing as the shipyard. It was a very large naval shipyard in Bremerton, Washington. It was attached to that, spent most of our time supporting the Far East. But this, things that still not, were just starting to get heated up more in, in, in Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia. Uh, I was pr promoted to lieutenant commander there. Uh, I was there for three years as a, contracts director, but then the, I was ordered, at that time it, I was either ordered, it was going to be ordered to Vietnam, this would have been in 1972, to Vietnam or uh, a, a uh, helicopter carrier on the East Coast. So I elected the helicopter carrier on the East Coast, the USS Guadalcanal Supply Officer LPH-7, which is another amphibious aircraft which basically supporting attached to an amphibious squadron carrying composite aircraft helicopters, usually composite Marine Corps uh, squadrons deployed in that, on that basis. Spent, um, as a lieutenant commander, spent two and a half, three years on Guadalcanal as a Supply Corps officer. But in this case, I really was a Supply Corps officer. Mm -hmm. I wasn't doing any, wasn't standing any bridge watches, although strangely enough, the, the senior watch officer said was going through my record, and he said, I, "Bill, he said, I see you qualify as a surface warfare officer. You could stand." Br I said, "No, I don't really want to stand bridges, bridge watches. I've got enough to do on this ship as far as the supply corps officer, which is the largest department, uh, seven divisions, which was a lot of, and we were carrying 1,800 Marines and maybe 600 ships company." Most of my time in those days, and this is when Vietnam was really, most of the Navy and the military uh, support was going to Southeast Asia. So the East Coast and the Navy in those days was pretty, uh, 
poorly manned. So the ship, instead of being, would, was manned at 80% 80, 80 perhaps of what you should have. So it was a difficult, it was a difficult two and a half years, particularly uh, because of the manning and activity, because we were gone all the time. We either, most of the time we were spending the med uh, for six months tours. Uh, the normal deployment would be six months with an amphibious squadron. Uh, and you'd re be relieved by another one on a six-month basis. It was a difficult time uh, in those days because of the buildup in Southeast Asia and also because of the, there was a lot of racial issues that we had to deal with. Uh, this would have been in the 72, 73, 74 time frame. Uh, so it was a difficult, but it was a difficult tour, but it was a, a challenging tour. Uh, again, after the Guadalcanal, I was ordered to uh, the Defense Contract Administration Office uh, in Bridgeport, Connecticut, as the, as the commander. I was a commander. I was a commander. Promoted to commander during that tour. That was a three-year tour. That was a DLA. That was a Defense Logistics Agency activity. We were supporting. We had the responsibility, I had the responsibility of part of New York and all of Connecticut about, it was a three-tier structure, it was a, so a contract administration offices, then you had districts, and then you had regions. This was a district office, uh, mainly civilian, mm -hmm. had four military. Uh, was challenging from an from a, uh, administration standpoint because we were seeing all defense contracts in that arena uh, as far as delivery. Most of our uh, was uh, some heavy vehicles, uh, not many weapons in the sense of missiles or launchers, but mostly logistic support. Mm -hmm. um, we lived in Bridgeport, Connecticut. We lived in a little town outside Bridgeport, Connecticut. We enjoyed that tour as well. That was a three-year tour as a commander. Then following that tour, I was ordered to, to, to uh, Washington to the Naval Sea Systems Command, which is one of the large buying commands. The Navy's broken, those was broken up into major commands. They had the Naval Sea Systems Command, Naval Air Systems Command, Electronic Systems Command, and in those days an Ordnance Systems Command. That's changed somewhat now, but that's the way it was in those days. I was ordered to NAVC, uh, in the as a division, Deputy Division Director in one of the uh, divisions in the O2 Contracting Division, which bought the responsibility now is to buy all submarines, all surface warfare, basically. So surface warfare, major ships, amphibious ships, submarines, but not mm -hmm. the aircraft. Mm -hmm. Where was that located? Was that at the Navy Yard? It, it, in those days, it is now. It wasn't in that day. In those days, it was in Crystal City. Okay. When I came here, as a mid, I came to Washington in 1976 as a mid-grade commander. Most of the major systems commands, nav, naval a, aviation, Electronics and SNAFC were all in Crystal City at that time. And I was attached to one of the divisions in NAFC. After that tour in that division, I was ordered to the, the, it, the way the Navy was structured, you had the systems commands, then there was a Naval Materiel Command, which those system commands reported to. The Materiel Command reported to the SECNAV as one of the ASNs in the Secretary of the Navy. That's the way that was structured. So I was ordered to the Naval Materiel Command, which is also in Crystal City. In fact, I spent my entire career after I came here in 76 until I retired in 91 in the D.C. area, but in five different jobs in different levels. Mm -hmm. I went from NAVC, the first tour of NAVC, I went over to the Naval Materiel Command in the Contract Administration Acquisition Division for three years, and then I was ordered to the AS, the Secretary of the Navy Installation and Logistics as Director of the Acquisition and Contracting Division. I was a captain by that time, 06. Following, and I spent three years there. Following that, as a result of that tour, I was ordered to become the Director of Contracts at Naval Sea Systems Command, which at the time was a flag officer position I was ordered back to NAVC as a director of procurement. O2 was the designation. This would have been in the mid-80s. Mm -hmm. 
starting in 80s. And I spent five years as a director of contracts in the FC. And the best part of this job was challenging it. This was during President Reagan buildup of the military. And we were buying submarine 688s, Ohio class. We were buying all the amphibious ships, the LHAs, the, L the LPDs. We were buying the support craft as well. So we had a tremendous budget. It was a very challenging but very self-rewarding tour. You ask about the change in the amphibious structure. They went to what they call the first change, major change. Was the vertical envelopment was a continuing thing. When I was on Guadalcanal, we were doing vertical envelopment in, in stew of landing. Instead of landing on the beach, we were overflying inland. Then they came up with a, they had a craft called an LCAC, which is a landing aircraft hovercraft, which took the place in effect of what used to be the LSTs, the major equipment. Most of the marine equipment could be carried by helicopter and landed by helicopter, but not all of it. Some of it was too heavy. So they had this landing craft that hovered and would go in and could go up on the beach inland over the beach, drop the hover, drop the ramp and offload the equipment. And they're still in use, still using those today. Um, so anyway, uh, I would, spent five years as director of contracts at NAVC. I was promoted selected for Admiral while I was in that job at the Naval Sea Systems Command. Following that command, I was ordered to what was then called the Competition Advocate of the General. It was a new job that had never been, it never existed, or it had existed twice, two, two previous people had occupied it, but it was Secretary of the Navy, John Lehman, introduced it to try to induce competition into the military acquisition. That was the idea. I spent two years in that job. It was called the CAG, Competition Africa General. What, and I, following that position, I was, elect, I was selected by the Assistant Secretary of the Navy for installation and logistics to become the director of contracts on his staff. Um, and I spent two years in that job. Um, and then it was changed. They changed the structure of the Navy Secretariat. INL disappeared. They had then, they called it ASN, RDNA, Research Development and Acquisition. And as a, after they changed that, uh, the title I became what was known as a DASN, which is a direct, a Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Acquisition and Contract Management under the ASN, Research Development and Acquisition. And they still have that structure today. Mm -hmm. It's the ASN, RDNA. And I retired from that job in 1991, 1992, mm -hmm. uh, as a as a 07, which is a Rear Admiral, lower half Supply Corps of the United States Navy, and then as a result of before I retired, the, then the ASN RDNA, he said I'd like he said that what had happened is that. The, the military had found the acquisition community and the military as a whole had found out that there was a severe lack of training, of organized structural training in the military services, both civilian and military, for ongoing long-term acquisition. There were five areas they were concerned about. Project management, engineering, logistics management, financial management, and quality assurance management. So they passed a law, the Congress passed a law in 1990 that said we want each service to create an office called the Director of Acquisition Career Management and we want each service to establish a training program uh, that will cover military and civilians and have an organized structure with advancement in these areas for expertise because we believe that particularly in project management there was a lack of structural control. So the secretary asked me, he said, I would like you to come back and be the director. We're way behind. We're a year behind. I'd like you to come back and help establish this program. Uh, and I said, well, how long you envision this taking? He said, well, probably it'll take you a year. It actually, I stayed in that job for 12 years after I went back. And that was a, a, a very interesting job. We structured and began and created a civilian and military program for this, these three, these five disciplines, and we would hire civilians at the 7-9-11 progress over three years, 
or 9-11-13 over the same three years where, and, and the beauty of this was the fact that we took college graduates and we also took military, young military officers, and mostly, well, both surface warfare and submarine and aviation officers in the project management side, mostly supply corps officers in the logistics side, which would make sense, mm -hmm. because the other services don't have supply corps core per se in their structures. They have specialists that carry that MOS, but they don't have cores like the Navy does. In any event, we, we built that program up, and, and the, the other beauty of the program was that the money was given to the project manager to fund these people over that period of time. So we assigned these people worldwide. We had 300, perhaps 300, 350 trainees over any given time, over three years. We also offered to help them pay for a master's degree once they came out of college. And it is still exists today. Uh, and we created the program at Defense Contract Management College down at Fort Belvoir for development of those areas. For, and then they have specialists now where you can qualify and get certified as a specialist in those areas based on your career and certain training mm -hmm. things that go with it. Mm -hmm. um, and I retired from that job in, in about 12 years. I think it was 20, maybe not, uh, 202, mm -hmm. something like that. Uh, and then midway, I, I, one area I, I didn't mention, during my tour at NAVC during the 50s, I was uh, elected and fortunate enough to go to be selected for uh, education at MIT in their six-month uh, executive development program, which was very interesting because it was a, a combination worldwide people, all over the people from all over the world, mm -hmm. uh, which was a very interesting six months to get to be able to talk to them about how they develop things in their companies, and uh, that's where we are today. So this was a procurement-related kind of educational experience? In MIT? Yeah. It was actually not procurement-related. It was related with the Navy got to send one person a year. Um, and it was, it was, a, it, it was called their, their professional development uh, program. And it took, uh, took executives from all different countries, from all different programs, from all different companies. And they all got together. We get, and it was not oriented to procurement per se. Mm -hmm. We had people from Australia, bankers from Australia, a lot of people from Europe, South America. I mean, it was a, it was a makeup of we had a bus a man who owned a bus company. We had aviation education. Um, we had uh, manufacturing, a lot of manufacturing. Uh, it was made up of perhaps 30 executives, mm -hmm. some from the auto industry, mm -hmm. some from the aviation industry. In Europe, it was from various industries. Uh, my roommates during that period, one was a South African that worked for a steel company. The other one was from England who was an executive with Smith Industries, which is a conglomerate sure. of various things. Very, very interesting, very interesting. Let's go back to Vietnam for a minute during that period of time. Um, you know, we're always interested in the atmospherics of the time, uh, what your experience was like that was different from, say, your peacetime uh, Navy support to the wartime environment. What, was, what were some of the changes? Well, from my perspective, the, it was demand for logistics and equipment and supplies. We had, when I was at Taiwan, when I was in uh, Bremerton, at the supply center in Bremerton, we were supporting Southeast Asia. This would have been in the early 70s. Um, they wanted to build up of capability, which we didn't have. So the major, it was a very, very strong push for logistics, particularly uh, equipment and flow, uh, supply core chain management. We had, for example, one of the big things in, in, in that time when I was in Bremerton is that they didn't have enough ammunition capability uh, to provide ammunition fast enough to the Southeast Asia they could, you can't uh, uh, provide that kind of thing by air. You can do some of it by air, but not, not enough. So if you looked up and down the West Coast, they didn't have enough ammunition capability and they didn't have enough ammunition facilities. So they had to build those up 
and we had to build it up rapidly. So we were very much more dependent on air supply, which the aviation couldn't keep up with. And they, couldn't, they couldn't meet the demand. And of course, it was growing exponentially. So they started taking areas of trying to change them into, we took uh, and expanded the ammunition capability uh, coming out of the Bremerton area significantly and also in mid, mid down the coast to provide, uh, but everything was going at those times, everything was going east into Southeast Asia, which was a big, that was the big demand. Uh, also, that's before the Bremerton area, before that uh, became the, uh, the Ohio class uh, missile submarine base. And before it was an ammunition base mm. in those days. And that's what we noticed, what I noticed the most was the increase. We couldn't, we couldn't provide the logistics as quickly as was needed, which is generally what happens uh, when you have that kind of demand. When I was on Guadalcanal on the, on, the, on the U.S. East Coast, the problem we had was that our facilities, our supply, and our requirements were very much lower than what was going east. The manpower, most of the facilities, and the requirements that were generated in the east were the top of the list, as of course they should be, mm -hmm. because uh, that's where the demand was and that's where the need was, mm -hmm. uh, which caused, as I mentioned before, which caused the, the East Coast to be more difficult to operate in any effective manner mm -hmm. uh, because of manpower for a lot of reasons. Sure. Uh, but, but we managed, we managed. As an officer, you had people working for you, you were connected to the command and control uh, structure. What kind of personnel issues were you experiencing during that time? You mentioned racial issues, but... The personnel mostly, I had, the people I had on Guadalcanal and people elsewhere were dedicated, for the most dedicated employees, both military and civilian. And we were doing as, the best we could, but the, but the requirements were difficult. Uh, this particular area of time of the 70s, shipboard was, was a, a difficult time from a, from a racial standpoint because they, this was the, the unrest because of Vietnam War itself and, some of the, and the unrest because of the minority situation in the U.S. was very much an issue and becoming very much at the head of the, at the, head of the line. And this was reflecting in the military as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was the most difficult uh, issue we had, besides the manpower, was just the number. Mm -hmm. uh, and as I say, most of the manpower was going east um, instead, of, uh, instead of to the west, to our east coast, to our, to our ships on the east coast. Mm -hmm. Personnel-wise, my, my whole career as civilian people and military people were outstanding for the most part, outstanding. Mm -hmm. And I served with some wonderful people, both civilian and military. And in my career, I had a great deal of interface with civilian population, probably more so than the average officer mm -hmm. because of the number of people. And the num but I had both, both military and civilian. Did you do much work with any of um, the places like Dahlgren, some of these labs in China Lake, that kind of thing? The Naval Sea, the, the O2 in Nav C was mainly oriented to shipbuilding mm -hmm. and producing. We had some projects with missiles. We were, Nav C at the time when I was there, for example, the, the, with the Aegis weapon system, which was the radar controlled, uh, fire control, uh, air control system on ships, was one of the big things going. We had a lot of programs that did. Uh, 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 shipboard-related weapons, but we didn't do a lot of work with munitions per se, because at the time then, in those days, we they took the Naval Ordnance Systems Command and combined it with the Naval Electric Electronic Systems Command, and there became three uh, big ones. Nav C was the largest, Nav Air was second, and then Nav X, which is the Electronic Systems Command, was third. They were all coordinated and located in. Crystal City. Then there was a period of time in the 90s when the, there was a push to get the systems commands out of Washington mm 
and they sent the Naval Sea Systems Command to the Navy Yard. They sent the Naval Air Systems Command to NAS Pax River, Patuxent River in Maryland. They sent the Electronic Systems Command to San Diego to separate them. Um, we didn't do a lot of weapons munition-wise, but we, so I didn't have a lot of interface with, uh, with uh, weapons uh, at that level. Most of my time was spent on buying submarines, mm -hmm. aircraft carriers, mm -hmm. uh, amphibious ships, and we were buying a lot of, a lot of ships mm -hmm. in those days, which was really exciting because it had shrunk considerably. The Navy had shrunk considerably after Vietnam um, in numbers uh, and modernization as well. So, The um, aviation boneyards are getting a lot of press these days. There's a lot of interest in historic aircraft and things like that. In your procurement activities, did you interact with any of those for parts? Uh, not so much. Uh, I, uh, because the Naval Sea Systems Command where I was oriented to was surface warfare was mainly mm -hmm. not aviation oriented. What, mm -hmm. what I was concerned with though, were we also had uh, shipyards, uh, inactive shipyards, ships tied up from the Second World War in various areas around the country. Mm -hmm. And the question is what we were going to do with them. They were supposed to be emergent requirements if we had any, but most of them had atrophied to the point where they were not really realistically to activate. We couldn't really activate them. So, uh, except I was there when they reactivated the battleships, mm -hmm. the three battleships. Uh, they took them out of mothballs and reactivated them. Uh, a lot of the others we actually scrapped and sent to be broken down. Um, and mostly was new, trying to bring on new craft. We, we built new frig frigates, we built new DDGs, uh, guided missiles, uh, destroyers, larger destroyers uh, than the frigate. The frigate was smaller than the destroyer. Um, we didn't, we had at one time a nuclear, we talked about nuclear surface, but they didn't last. We had nuclear I don't remember how many, we had two nuclear cruisers too. Uh, the only nuclear crafts we have basically are the, are the uh, aircraft carriers, are all nuclear now. In those days they were both fossil fuel and nuclear. All the CVNs, all the aircraft carriers are nuclear. All the submarines are nuclear. In those days we had some diesel boats and some nuclear. There was crossing over uh, slowly the diesel boots were phased out because of the, so the submarines are all nuclear, aircraft carrier are nuclear, but that's the only nuclear craft we have. We don't have any surface craft mm -hmm. that are nuclear per se. We tried it, but it became too difficult to maintain and man, uh, and most of those uh, priorities went to the submarines and, and CVNs, which are the carriers were. Mm -hmm. So, but I didn't have a great deal to do with missiles per se. Mm -hmm. uh, we were buying them, but they weren't the highest priority in those days. It was mainly oriented to, to ships mm -hmm. and submarines. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else you uh, remember I'd like to mention? No, I, th I think I've covered the, my career per se, mm -hmm. except uh, military career was very rewarding. Mm -hmm. Never regretted it. Enjoyed it very much. Was very fortunate in the in the career and the jobs that I had. The people I worked for and the people that worked for me were very capable, and uh, it was a wonderful career. So mm -hmm. I would just recommend anybody that's thinking about that kind of career, uh, professionally and rewarding education as well. Mm -hmm. It's well worth it. Mm -hmm. One of the last questions we typically ask are uh, related to these videos will be in a repository where researchers and other people can, can look at them in the future, you know, long after we're all gone. And, um, you know, future generations, if you, you know, your family or others may look at these. Is there any message you'd like to send to them about, uh, I mean, you kind of did just now with uh, summation of your, your value of your career. Any other messages you'd like to, to send? 
only to say that I would certainly consider this kind of a career if it's oriented to what you have an interest in. And there's generally, in the military or in the, in the military structure, there's an area of interest that you can find. If you have an area of interest, you can find the need mm -hmm. and you can find a place that you'd be well rewarded mm -hmm. to participate in. I certainly never regretted anything as far as staying in the Navy, becoming a regular officer, the jobs that I had, I was very fortunate mm -hmm. and would encourage anyone to think about it in a positive way. Well, thank you very much, and of course, thank you for your service, Bill. Well, thank you.